Hello, everyone. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. This is a pretty pivotal time in the field of education for neurodivergent kids. We're seeing many school districts struggling to find better ways to serve this growing group of students, including twice exceptional students. So we have developed a course designed for educators called Strategies for Supporting Twice Exceptional Students. It's cloud-based, and it includes videos, printable documents, and discussion guides, quizzes, and completion certificate. There are six different modules that cover a ton of topics, from best practices of identification to supporting executive function skills to understanding the needs of various diagnoses of twice exceptional students. It comes in three different versions. One is for in-house professional development training for teachers. Another is a site license for school districts so they can designate a number of teachers to take it as a self-study course. And finally, we have an independent study version for individual teachers or anyone else for that matter, which can also be taken all at once or at your own pace. In total, it's about 12 hours of professional development. We are really excited for you to see it. It will be available in early January. But you can see a sample video and download a course objective summary, kind of like a syllabus, now at www.neurodiversity.university. It's not .com. University is the domain suffix. So it's neurodiversity.university. What is neurodiversity? What is it about these people? Dyslexia. Autism spectrum. ADHD. Gifted. Dysgraphia. All brains are different. It's okay to be who you are. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. Hi, and welcome to episode 106. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. On this episode, Dr. Sean Robinson talks to us about his experience growing up as a 3E student, that is, gifted, dyslexic, and Black. And he shares about his work now, including authoring the books about the fun character, Dr. Dyslexia Dude. Before we jump into our interview, I want to take a moment to invite you to join our Facebook group. The Neurodiversity Podcast Advocacy and Support Group is a place for parents and educators, clinicians, neurodivergent people to share their questions and experiences with other neurodiversity affirming folks. If you enjoy connecting with other people who understand neurodiversity, this is a great place for you. You can also follow our social media pages in the typical places. On Instagram and Facebook, we are Neurodiversity Podcast. And on Twitter, we are at NeurodiversePod. Up next... My name is uh, Sean Anthony Robinson, also known as Dr. Dyslexia Dude. Stay with us. Identifying, supporting, and challenging gifted and twice exceptional students is often difficult for school districts. But Emily Kircher Morris's new book, Teaching Twice Exceptional Learners in Today's Classroom, provides guidelines and a unique approach for identifying and understanding 2E students. It includes strategies that will help educators and administrators provide strength based instruction, motivate twice exceptional learners, and even help them with self regulation. It contains important information to help educators advocate for 2E students including things you need to know about individualized education plans and the Section 504 plan process. This important new book is now available. Go to neurodiversitypodcast.com for links to get your copy. Teaching Twice Exceptional Learners in Today's Classroom from Free Spirit Publishing. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. Today, we're talking with Dr. Sean Robinson. Sean, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me here. You know, one of the things that I love about talking to neurodivergent people for the podcast who are also advocates and working in the field is that we get to know a little bit about your journey. So why don't we start off with you telling a little bit about your history and experiences growing up as a neurodivergent child and how that brought you to the work that you do today. Uh, yeah, so uh, my experience is journey. I can't generalize it to other people, but it's similar past, particularly with students with dyslexia. Um, and so in my early, early, early elementary years, I found myself um, really avoiding learning. Um, I didn't care about school and I found myself getting into a lot of trouble and um, I was just angry, really bitter. Um, and a lot of the teachers, I shouldn't say a lot, some of the teachers uh, were not able to probably identify my dyslexia, maybe the lack of training, you know, but I had some really excellent teachers, like just ones who I, I love today um, that really helped me 
get on the path of success, um, particularly in high school. But even when I got to high school, I found myself uh, going in the, the wrong direction really fast. I found myself getting into uh, you know a lot of fights, doing a lot of destructive things, um, getting caught up with the, the, the with the law. Um, I got kicked out of high school when I was a sophomore. Um, was sent to a term of high school for two years. So I felt like my my life was spiraling in the wrong direction, and particularly in in high school, when we talk about neurodiversity and kids who are gifted and twice exceptional. Um, I didn't really learn about the twice exceptionality until I got to my PhD program. I was reading the literature, but then it made sense about my lived experiences because in high school, uh, one of my coaches, Coach Carpenter, the pretty much like the dean of students at the time, you know, he said, "Sean, by the time you're 18 or you're you're, uh, you're gonna be dead or you're gonna be in jail. Mm. You know, everything I've tried to do for you up to this point, you've been resistant. You 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 know, just make it hard. And I don't know what to do anymore with you. It's like I don't know what to do, but I'm gonna try one more thing with you. And I was like, okay." He said, I want you to be a peer mentor and a coach for Special Olympics. And I'm like, what? You want me to be a coach and a peer? I'm like, I don't want to do that stuff. I'm like, that's, you know, I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I've been a coach 20 years. Mm-hmm. I've been a coach, been involved with Special Olympics for over 20 years. Um, probably the, the greatest life experience that I probably will ever have is coaching Special Olympics. Uh, those student athletes, when I was a sophomore in high school and I was, on a, uh, a track of self-destruction, they really taught me how to love myself. They really taught me how to appreciate life and take life as it comes and um, always have a smile on your face and don't worry about, you know, what comes at you. Mm-hmm. They just taught me so much about myself. And here I am, I was a sophomore, angry, couldn't read. And they put me in a position of leadership. And I'm like, you know, it just changed my perspective of how I saw myself, even though I still couldn't read, I still struggled. In order for me to coach still, I had to change my behavior. And the athletes knew how much I cared for them and they know how much they cared for me. So I was kind of like in the bind where I was like, look, if I want to coach, I have to change my behavior. And so uh, my teachers at the term of high school outside really helped me um, learn about just loving myself within um, the school environment. And, um, but that's when we think about twice exceptionality, students who are gifted in different areas, leadership. And I didn't really know that I was a part of this whole twice exceptionality until I was in my doc program reading the literature. And I was like, wait, I've 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 lived this like this. This is something I've actually experienced before. And so um, that was one one uh, experience I had, uh, particularly uh, with coaching Special Olympics. Like I said, they the student athletes, they've come to my uh, graduation, undergrad, master's, Ph.D., they came to my wife's and I wedding uh, shower. Like they've 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 been like a, a family to me, you know. And even twenty years later, I'm still in contact with them. I still speak with them, you know. Um, and so it's just been a, a real blessing and joy to be a part of that community. Particularly, you know, when in high school, you know, I bullied people. I, I'm not proud of it. I got bullied in high school, but those kids were always constantly being bullied by somebody. You know, they're always getting uh, put into a, a category of what they can't do because of their so-called disability, right? But they were the happiest kids in the world. Like they always had a smile on their face. They always laughed. They always, they're just full of so much love. Like, and they always say, you know, we help people, right? But I think they helped me more than I actually helped them because they they gave me life. They gave me a, uh, inspiration. They gave me, uh, you know, the model, you know, they gave me, you know, like little train, choo-choo. They just, <laughs> they, they, they kept going. Like they never stopped. They just kept moving. And I think that's, you know, something that weared off on me too throughout my my journey. And then even when I was going into my, my senior year, uh, my mother wanted to find out why I was struggling academically. Like I was just, people told me I was stupid. And my high school counselor told me I'd never be college material. She said those words to my mom. She's like, your son is not college material. Like she said that to my mother. And mom was like, no, 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 my son's going to college. Like, He's going to be somebody. So like any mom would do, you know, she, you know, exhausted her resources and tried to find um, anybody or anything that could help figure out why I was struggling academically. And so she's at a beauty salon and overheard some mothers talking about a program for adult learners with dyslexia. And uh, she called and she said, hey, I need some help. I need to figure out why my son is uh, acting this way and why he can't read and why the system's not helping them. So the professor at the time, Dr. Robert T. Nash, was like, hey, come up. I'm going to meet you and your son. 
So here we are driving from the suburbs of uh, Chicago to Wisconsin. It's a blizzard. I'm screaming, cursing, <laughs> kicking, and screaming like a little kid, throwing, throwing a temper tantrum. Because I was scared. Like, I, you know, I, I was immature. And my mom stopped and she called. She's like, Dr. Nash, we're not coming. He was like, no, you're coming. He was like, no snowstorm should stop you from getting your education. So we get in. I'm still kicking, screaming. Mom's screaming. We're all screaming, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we get there and he calls me to his office and uh, gives me some uh, assessments to do. And, you know, the first word he asked me to spell was Kane. And I was like, oh, yeah, phonetically, I can spell that. K-A-M, like it sounds, right? And so he gives me some more assessments and then comes back to the word again and it says, um, spell it. I said, I just spelled, I just spelled it, you know, like K-A-M. Then he looks me in the eye and says, you are one of the most illiterate kids I've ever met in my life. Like mm-hmm. you, you are extremely dyslexic and you've been, you've been failed by a system, but I see a gift in you and I'm going to teach you how to read, but it's going to be a, a lot of work. And, and it's going to be a lot of commitment. And if you're willing to do it, I'm going to help you. And he's like, I'm going I'm to accept you into my program, but it doesn't guarantee you're accepting it to university. You still have to go through the whole process. But the fact that I accept you carries a lot of weight. So on the way home, I'm crying. My mom's crying. I'm like, I'm going to college. She's like, you're going to college. I graduated high school. Um, I graduated reading at an elementary level. All, all my scores reflected at an elementary level student or below. Uh, two weeks after I graduated, I started uh, his uh, remedial program for adult learners, which was an eight-week intensive uh, program. And after that, I never looked back. Yeah. Taught me how to read. I became a sponge. Uh, and, then, you know, it took me six years to get my undergrad degree because I had to make up everything I missed in the K-12 system. I had professors that told me I wasn't going to make it, failed me, told me to do something different. So the same narrative I heard through the high school, I just kept moving. I just, I just stayed on the ropes like Muhammad. You know, I just kept bobbing and weaving. Like I didn't, I wasn't going to, you know, throw in a towel. Um, and so then after six years, I, I went on and got a master's degree and I was on academic probation for the first two semesters. And I had some great uh, faculty members there that really um, encouraged and supported me. And then after 11 straight years out of high school, I went on and got a PhD and I was in that for seven years and I kept moving. And so after uh, high school, I was in school 18 years. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm tired. Like, <laughs> like it's, a long, it's, a, it's a long, long, long time to be uh, uh, getting a degree. But, you know, um, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And so in 2017, um, my high school inducted me into the Hall of Honor. So my, my, my plaque is up on the wall at the school. And that speaks volumes to where I came from, where I started. So that's the only plaque I have. I don't have my diplomas. I don't have my accolades. I don't, but I have that because it reminds me of who I am and where I came from and all the people that invested in me to get where I'm at today. So um, I'm just very thankful for um, the opportunities I've had and the people that um, helped me get here. Was this program associated with the university that you got into? Yeah, yeah. I feel like those types of programs now are growing as we've grown in our awareness of dyslexia and, and everything, well, just neurodivergence in general. And dyslexia is a diagnosis that is really misunderstood just in general. It sounds like that's one of the things that really influenced the difficulties you had with getting support when you were young. Um, even teachers don't often really understand what it is or how to support it even today. So how would you explain what dyslexia is to people who don't understand it or really know much about it? For me, when I, when I explain it to, to kids, you know, our, our adults I work with, particularly teaching reading, I, I, I try to keep it simple in terms of a construction worker, right? What they do, they, they destroy things, take things down, put things together. So when we, we look at print on paper, we want to be able to decode it, take it apart, put it together. And if we're unable to do that by sounds and syllables and really understand how to construct and deconstruct words, that's going to impact our fluency and our comprehension. For me, when I have that conversation with students or adult learners, they, they have the aha moment. Like, oh, wait, wow, that, that makes sense then. So, um, yes, you know, phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, those things are, are critical. A lot of kids don't understand what those terminology means. So I try to break it down where it's very simple for them so they can see it um, and then really understand how that impacts their fluency and how fluency impacts their ability to understand or comprehend something. So 
that's how I explain it. It's not right or wrong, but um, I just, that's how I, I try to, you know, explain it to people. Another thing is, I think there are a lot of myths and misunderstandings about dyslexia too. So for example, I, I know a lot of people who think that dyslexia has to do with visual processing, although that's not really what it is. It has to do with the sound symbol connection um, in the brain. So what are some of the misconceptions in general that you think are important to clear up about dyslexia? Uh, I, you know, I think the biggest one for me is they say people, kids are lazy, right? Oh, they're just lazy. They're stupid. You know, uh, no, they're not lazy. They're probably just bored because you don't know how to, you're not teaching them right. Like, if you taught them right, they would be engaged and they would be wanting to, you know, be more motivated. But if you're not teaching them, yeah, of course they'd be bored. Like, I'd be bored, too, if you're not going <laughs> to teach me. I'd be I'll be lazy, too, right? I mean, so I think that's probably the biggest one is that the myths, you know, is that they're all just lazy. And then, you know, the backwards, you know, they always read backwards, you know. I mean, students mix up their letters, B's and D's. That's kind of as P's and Q's, right? Yes, but it doesn't mean they read backwards. They just... To me, it means they have a, a deal time processing the sounds and mm-hmm. relationship between the letters. But with the right intervention, any kid can blossom. I mean, they can soar. They just need the right intervention and in, in the right environment. But they're not lazy. Yeah. I mean, they just they just need the the space. So I think for me, if we think about the myths out there, that's probably the biggest one is that oh, you know, little Johnny's is lazy or Sean is lazy or Emily's lazy. No, 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 no we're not lazy. We we just need the right support and the right intervention to be able to move us from A to B. It's one of my favorite soapboxes to get onto is like this fighting back against this belief that kids are lazy or unmotivated because they have neuro differences. They learn differently. They're the square peg that doesn't fit in the round hole. And in in schools, we are just constantly trying to, this is the path. This is the way we teach. This is what we do. And if you don't fit here, sorry, we're really making some progress there, but slowly. And I'm sure that for you, it really just took a long time, as you talked about, to kind of undo some of those beliefs. Yeah, it's like when when Dr. Nash taught me how to read, it was over. Like, um, I just became like a construction worker with a a big ball and just started knocking things out the way because um, he just gave me life. Like, he literally gave me hope to be able to achieve anything I put my mind to. And that's all it took was the right person, the right diagnostic assessment and the right intervention. That was it. You've mentioned a little bit about talking to kids about dyslexia with that analogy of the construction worker. What what other things do you think adults need to know about talking to kids about dyslexia? Everyone's got their own different approach. You know, I'll never say my way is the right way uh, because everyone, um, you know, has uh, experience. I think just for me, it's, it's listening and understanding, right? We, we can't, when I say we, myself, I can't build community with an adolescent or adult learner if I don't listen to them and understand where they're coming from. Like, that's the first thing is like building that community. That's what I learned from Special Olympics. Like, you just can't come in and say, you know what, I'm the dictator, you do what I say, and boom, like, that's not going to work. So I always try to listen to the kid or the adult and hear their pain and acknowledge the pain and then ask them, you know, how is it that I can help you? get to the level you want to get to just being proficient at a better reader. Mm-hmm. And once I, he- I hear that, then I can be able to develop a plan of action to get them to that step. Like, but I want to be able to really understand the student where they come from before I just make assumptions. Yeah. Like I just want to dive, dive in and be like, you know what? Yeah. You know, I'm 43 years old and I know what's best for you because you're a, a seven year old. No, nah, like I want to listen to a student and I want to figure out from there, from my experience and expertise, then I want to be able to then work and help them. But I want to listen first, if that makes sense. Oh, totally. I think it, what I hear you saying is letting kids be the expert in their own lives and taking a collaborative approach. Education is not something that is done to you. It is a process. It is something that you're going through. And hopefully we're working with kids and bring them along in that process. But if we if we undermine that that ownership or that agency we undermine all of that motivation. Yeah, Yeah, they are unmotivated. They are bored because they don't have that buy-in. I just told my adult learners the other day in my, uh, I teach a wear analysis course at the community college. I just told them this. I said, there's only three things I care about. That's it. Confidence, being independent and empowered. That's all I care about. That's it. Yeah. Because as they go through this class and learn about sounds and letters and analytics and synthetic right approaches to teaching reading and 
looking at words and studying words and studying the first sound, second sound, third sound, and, you know, pronunciation and orthographic mapping and really start to understand the principles behind it. Those three things are built, confidence, independent, and they're empowered. Mm -hmm. Because once they get that, they're on their own, right? They're confident. They're independent. They don't need me. They don't need anybody else. And then they become empowered. So um, that's why I try to tell uh, the students I work with uh, in class. I just, that's the only three things I care about. And I ask them, am I wrong? They all say, no, that's what we want. You know, and I was actually originally introduced to your work through a project that you worked on with Dr. Joy Lawson Davis for Scott Barry Kaufman's book, Twice Exceptional. I love the fact that there's so much work now that's being done by scholars like yourself and Dr. Joy Lawson Davis and uh, Dr. Christina Collins, who are supporting minoritized twice exceptional learners. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about that term 3E. I think it's the same thing, you know, just build that community, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding, listening, uh, you know, understanding students' capitals, linguistic capital, cultural capital, social capital, uh, family capital, all those things, just having an opportunity and space where kids feel valued mm -hmm. and their and their voices are heard. If those those things don't happen, you've lost the kid already. Like you've lost them. Like if there's not an environment where they feel safe that they can express themselves either orally or through clothes or how they want to do it, you've lost them. So I think that's the biggest thing when it comes to mismatch between systems and communities is that the systems are seen as the dominant figures and they're not learning from the community or building relations with the community. So I think that's the biggest thing is we talk about 3E and you know 2E is just you got to you got to listen. It just goes back to community. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to have buy-in. If you don't have buy-in, I mean, it's going to be hard. You mentioned talking about cultural capital and can you elaborate a little bit on that for maybe listeners who aren't familiar with what that term is referring to specifically? values, their traditions, you know, what do their families value, uh, what's their family's upbringing, just really get to learn the student and their family and their values. I think that's so, so critical in uh, developing relationships. But a lot of times, only one culture is seen as the dominant one, and then other voices or cultures are left out, right? It's monolithic. It's only one. And it's like, no, wait. Educational spaces, particularly in special ed or gifted, are a melting pot, right? They they have so much creativity and so many minds that are essentially getting wasted because systems keep oppressing their minds and not tapping into their full potential or understanding their home environment. I think it's important to understand the holistic uh, approach to a um, student's development. Tell us about the children's book that you've written. So my wife and I have written... Uh, Dr. Dyslexia Dude, and the third book's coming out in uh, October. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was think about culture and just gifted. And only a certain percent of people read those research articles, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, really, that, that's, that's really the, to fill egos for people in the academy. I mean, this is, this is keep it 100%. You know, it's not like I'm making anything up or making lies. That's really to please the people in the academy, the ivory tower folks, right? But then I'm thinking, do those ivory tower folks, some of them, do they really care about reaching the communities that need to be served the most? And I'm thinking, are parents reading these articles? I mean, I don't want any parents reading these articles, particularly in underserved communities or even any community. Like if your parents are not uh, in that circle, they're most likely not going to read some book chapter or research article. So my wife and I are like, hey, how can we make the work more accessible? And how can we make a figure of color that represents a student with a learning disability, but also a superhero. So that's what, that's what we did. We just say, you know what? We're going to be uh, unique, gifted, and we're going to use our talent, art, and pull the team together. And, uh, you know, we've been very, very humble experience to do it. Um, you know, again, we just wanted to try to give kids hope. We wanted kids to see themselves in um, books that represent, you know, their capital, their experiences. And uh, we didn't think it was going to take off the way it did. But we just wanted to have some representation in a, a, a kid's book because so many times, you know, these publishing companies say, oh, we can't find authors of color or, you know, there's not representation of, of characters. Well, 
wife and I were like, we're just going to make do it ourselves. <laughs> we're going to do it ourselves. Like, Because, you know, I'm not going to try to go through an a agent. I tried that, got, got turned down. Look, I'm not trying to please anybody. I'm not trying to look for their approval. I'm going to do what's best in my heart. I'm okay not having a a, a book agent because I'm not playing games. Yeah. I'm just want to be able to serve and you want to get it out there. Yeah, I want to get it out there, and I don't want to jump through all these hoops and have people tell me what I can can I write in a book. And my wife, you know, is the one who's really the writer behind it. You know, at the scenes, and uh, we work together on it with a, a great team. And so uh, we're gonna keep doing it until you know we decide it, it's time to stop doing it. But you know, the, the feedback we've gotten from kids is that they love it. You know, they love seeing a character of color, mm -hmm. a superhero that's black, brown, however you want to frame it. Uh, and then the new book we have coming out, we have three new characters. So uh, it's going to be a, a team and it's going to be diverse. So uh, we're just trying to change a narrative. And that's been our phrase for a while is just change the narrative. I imagine that that process for you has been, in a lot of ways, really therapeutic for a lot of the situations that you experienced as a kid. Yeah, just, you know, be able to give back. That's the biggest thing, you know, is it feels good to serve. You know, I've made mistakes throughout my academic and life, but that's, 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 it's life. We, you know, we pivot, we make moves and we learn from them. And, but it's just to be able to give back to students and uh, let them know there's hope at the end of the tunnel, you know, uh, that they too can be successful. They don't have to be a Richard Branson. They don't have to be, you know, a, a celebrity or a music star. They, they always put on these posters, you know, that make kids feel like, hey, you have to be a billionaire, you know, with dyslexia. No, just live your dream. Just do what you want to do. Stay in your lane and just be happy at peace of what decisions you make. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a Richard Branson. I'm not, I'm not flying to, to, to the moon. Like, you know, I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm just me. I'm just Sean Anthony Robinson. Just want to be who I am and how I contribute to not just my two boys and my family, but contribute to society before I, before I leave. That's a lot of pressure to put on kids. Yeah. It's like, if you don't reach this pinnacle, then, you know, it's unsuccessful. It's like, no, just be you. Be who you are. But that's that's society, right? That's social media. Right. That's the news. That's, you know, systems that say, hey, if you dyslexic, you got to be at this level. You have to be a billionaire. You have to compensate. Yeah. No, just just do what you do and do it well and be happy with who you are and be happy with, you know, the, the path that you've taken. That's it. So last question as we wrap up. If you were talking directly to a dyslexic student who has begun to internalize that belief that they are dumb or that they can't do the work or that they're spinning their wheels and not making any progress, what would you say to them? Like, what is the one thing that you would really want them to hear? You know, even looking back at my own experiences and sharing with kids is that, you know, we got to encourage them to write their own narrative, right? We got to encourage them to, to be the author of their own story, their own life. Uh, because if somebody writes your story for you, it's not going to turn out the way that you want it. And even to stay in that dark box, you know, it's not it's not a lovely place. So we need to figure out how we can mentally shift out of it. So um, but it takes time. Like it, it's not something that can happen overnight. It takes time. But again, it's like a little train. Choo, choo. Mm -hmm. every, every step we take, we get closer to that breakthrough. And we get closer. Sometimes we want to feel like we want to quit. But when we when that time comes, like we feel like we want to quit, we gotta keep pushing. We gotta keep moving. So that's why I just tell students that you just gotta keep moving. You gotta, you have to keep moving. Mm -hmm. You cannot give up. There's no give up in your vocabulary. Look in the mirror and tell yourself, I love myself, I can do it, I will do it, I'm able to do it. Like we just gotta change the narrative for students, a lot of them to see themselves as being you know, the dictators of their own life. Like they control their own destiny. They are the ones that are able to say what I can and cannot do. So that's what that's what I try to tell students is look, I'm not perfect. I'm not I'm not trying to tell you what you have to do. I'm not gonna tell you what you should do. All I'm gonna tell you is my experience is how I've gotten to this point in my life is that I just had good people, good faith, and I just never gave up. But it was hard. Like yeah, I wouldn't give up a lot of times, but I just had to keep keep moving. Dr. Sean Anthony Robinson, thank you so much for your time today. Well, Emily, thank you so much. Appreciate being here. Normalizing neurodiversity is key to helping all kids access the supports they need. Representation matters. 
if kids don't see characters in books and movies who represent their heritage, or if they don't ever get to read about people whose brains function like their own, they continue to feel different and internalize the stigma of being the other. There is nothing more powerful than a role model, whether real or fictional, that represents the best version of how we want to see ourselves in the future. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Thank you to Sean Robinson for being here today. You can find more information about his work and his book series, Dr. Dyslexia Dude, on the episode 106 page at neurodiversitypodcast.com. Our thanks, as always, to the musicians who appeared here on this episode, Arc de Salil, Gavin Luke, Windshield, and Dexter Green. Hey, if you're an educator, remember to check out our first offering in the Neurodiversity University, a course called Strategies for Supporting Twice Exceptional Students. It's at neurodiversity.university. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Executive producer and post production editor is me, Dave Morris. For all of us here, thanks. We'll see you next time. This is a production of Morris Creative Services.